Arne Ness was a mountaineer. He climbed mountains, he wrote about them, wrote on them in a vertiginous shed and chained himself to one to protest successfully about the building of a dam. He was Norway's most elevated philosopher and one of the chief intellectual influences on the European Green Movement as it began to find a political voice in the early 1970s. Not every thinker, not every idea from those days has survived, but Arne Ness's essays have just been published in English by Penguin Modern classics, and they reveal the thinking of a man who used the writings of the 17th century philosopher Spinoza to found what he called the deep ecology movement, the most radical kind of environmentalism that exists. As part of a new strand on free thinking that looks at works freshly translated into English, we're going to find out about Ness and what his ideas might mean in theory and in practice, with the help of two philosophers who have read deeply in his writings. Eki de Jonga is connected to us from the BBC studio in Orkney, and Rupert Reid is with me here in London. He's also chair of the environmental think tank, The Greenhouse. Eki, let me come to you first. Arne Ness, uh, big in Norway, like the mountains are big, not so big here. Let's do the biography first. Who was he? Okay, so Arne Nez, um, as you already said, was Professor of Philosophy at the University of Oslo. He was the youngest professor ever, aged 27. He had been a very traditional philosopher working in mathematics and analytical philosophy. And then he radically changed when in the 1950s he led, he was a keen mountaineer, he led a party of um, explorers up the Hindu Kush he came back from this expedition. He resigned his position as professor of philosophy. He then um, created a new form of philosophy, well, which, which he called a new form of philosophy called deep ecology. And then uh, about a decade later, he was asked to take up his place again at the university. I'm curious about what happened to him in the mountains, uh, Rupert. He moved from the circle of Wittgenstein, didn't he, in Vienna, um, went to the Hindu Kush. And I suppose like a lot of people in that period came from that Western academic tradition and then was exposed to one that was alien to him. What happened to him there? Yeah, I think that it's crucial for Ness and for deep ecology that he came from Norway and that he was steeped in the mountains and that he then had this transformative experience in the mountains. Now, you might think that that makes him and his thought quite remote from many of us living in a densely populated country like England. It seems to me actually the boot's on the other foot. I think Ness really has something to tell us that we may have lost touch with, in other words, basically, nature and the sense of the awesome Um, and that when one starts to take that seriously, then one becomes open to the kind of radical challenge to modern civilization that Ness went on to make with deep ecology. But Eki, what happened to him in those mountains? What was that transformative experience? Well, I think part of it was that when he was there, when he was travelling, he he picked up the the Hindu branch of philosophy known as Advaita Vedanta, which regards all reality as just being one and everything being interconnected. He also stumbled across the writings of Gandhi. And then when he came back um, to the West, he, I think he tried to link that to, Easter, uh, to Western thought. And he did so. He thought he'd done so through looking at the 17th century Dutch philosopher Spinoza. I want to explore how all of these ideas um, fit together because it's a rather complicated story. But the the idea, the body of ideas, the school of thinking that emerges from it is deep ecology. Maybe we could have a go, Rupert, at at defining that. Yes, so deep ecology as opposed to what? So shallow ecology. Basically, Ness thought that most actually existing ecology and environmentalism was shallow. It didn't really challenge in any serious or deep way the presuppositions of our civilization. So, for example, environmentalists often say... Um, We need to make growth greener. You know, it's no good having old fashioned grey or brown growth. You've got to make growth greener. Ness would say something like, hang on a minute. Why are we still pursuing the growth paradigm at all? Why are we so convinced that industrial civilization should just keep on expanding and growing? forever. So deep ecology as opposed to shallow ecology, deep ecology really wants to put nature and the imperative for life first. And it thinks that it may be that industrial growth capitalism as we know it is not compatible with that. How would you define it, Eki? Yeah, I would define it in a slightly different way. Um, I would define it as that Nez wanted or regarded the deepness of deep ecology as the ways we have been or the ways we have been conditioned to view ourselves in relation to the natural world as separate and superior. 
and that what he was trying to do or what he believed was that if we asked deeper questions about ourselves, this would lead each of us to realise that we are part of, not separate from the non-human world. And he believes Spinoza's view that there's only one substance uh, that Spinoza called God or nature would help us to realise this as all beings, according to Nez, are seeking self-realisation. Now, Spinoza is very important in the in Ness's Extremely, mental architecture, yes. isn't he, Rupert? And he encountered him in his teenage mm. years, didn't he? How do what is he really doing? Because in the in the seventies, this 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 group of ideas, this movement is is burgeoning. We get events like Earth Day, the environmental movement, really kind of um, gets going. But for Ness, it's something that's rooted in the seventeenth century. Um, how so? Well, I think the key here is what Eki already said, God or nature. For Spinoza, these are really two ways of looking at the same thing, this one uh, thing that we all are um, a part of. I think one can see this quite helpfully in a sort of grand historical way. So if one goes back to our hunter-gatherer days, then you might argue that the, the natural religion for that time was something like animism. We move to large-scale agricultural civilization, and we have the dominance of monotheism. We move to large-scale industrial civilization, and arguably we have the dominance of materialism or atheism um, as a religion. What is the appropriate for religion for a time of true global global consciousness for a time when we actually wake up to the huge challenge that faces us and find a completely new but yet old way of relating to the world in such a way that we no longer, as Eki said, even think of it as a relation, but as just one thing that we are a part of. I would suggest that the most natural religion for such a time is pantheism. So perhaps when you have someone like Spinoza, who was a heretic and much abused in his own lifetime, and you have somebody like Ness, similarly mocked, caricatured ruthlessly, perhaps they're going to have the last laugh, because I would suggest that if there is going to be a human future, it may well be that the kind of spiritual thinking, the kind of religious orientation that future will have is a pantheistic one, which says God, nature, they're the same thing. I want to go on to discuss how his ideas might be implemented or might have been implemented. But there's there's one thing, Eki, that I'd like you to address. Ness said that he wanted to take ecology away from ethics and towards ontology. So yeah. throw me a bone here. Exp tell me what that means. <laughs> OK, so I think if you... If you distinguish, say, deep ecology from shadow ecology as the difference between shallow ecology, shallow ecology, yeah. shallow ecology as the difference between metaphysics and applied ethics, I'll just say a couple of things about that. So, in metaphysics, what you're doing is we're seeking to understand the nature of reality or the nature of who we are or of beings as they exist. Whereas, if you're talking about applied ethics, you're seeking to um, demonstrate or to give um, ideas of how we ought to behave, what we should do. And what Nez was trying to show was um, by drawing on Spinoza was how if we question ourselves, we will come to see that who we we're not there isn't something we're not separate from the environment we're actually part of the natural world and this is what he wanted to actually he said everybody has to realize for themselves now this is completely different than say a mandate which says well you know we ought to preserve the environment you know we ought to um, conserve our oil resources for example they're completely different programs and I think one of the things Nez tried to do later on was to combine them both but they're different ways of seeing the world of thinking. Rupert let's talk about how these ideas have made their way into 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 policy or to advocacy anyway um this is not an entirely jolly story is it because the, these ideas have been associated with some with some fairly obnoxious ideas um like uh the earth firsters perhaps who were quite keen on aids and uh, famine as mechanisms for regulating the world's population they were certainly regarded themselves as followers of of ness and i'm not sure what he would have made of them well you have to be careful who you listen to in terms of what the earth firsters uh, believed i was an earth firster i was there for redwood summer in 1990 and my experience of earth first was that i didn't meet anybody like that 
Um, so I think that there's been a lot of um, bad press for uh, this movement, partly because of the radical challenge that it offers to the status quo. It tries to... So that nobody expressed those opinions? No. Are people, you familiar with that? Of course idea, people yes. did occasionally express those opinions, but they were incredibly marginal. They were certainly nothing that Ness believed, and they were nothing that the main figures in Earth First or many of the foot soldiers like myself um, actually uh, believed at that time. The real challenge that that deep ecology lays down is a challenge to our anthropocentrism and in particular, in my view, a challenge to our incredible short-termism. Uh, and it seems to me that actually possibly a trick that Ness uh, missed and that is necessary if we're going to cha- if we're going to carry through the difficult task of carrying deep ecology through into politics, which is what I think we need to do, is to not see that it might be possible to combine anthropocentrism and ecocentrism if we take a long-term enough view. In other words, what I believe is that if we take a long-term enough view, the true interests of human beings and of our ecosystems tend to coincide because what our children and our children's children and their children actually need is functioning ecosystems is a biodiverse world so my thought would be that ultimately it may be that deep ecology can come into politics by us enabling people to see if we can enable them to see this that true long-termism means that actually a human-centric view doesn't have to be opposed to an ecocentric view Aki do you think it's possible to translate these ideas into into political action of some kind I think it is, but not directly. I mean, one of the reasons that Nez drew on Spinoza was because Spinoza helps us to look at the way we've been conditioned to to see ourselves. So we're looking at the way that that our culture and our history actually forms our ideas and our relationship not only to other human beings, but also to the natural environment. And what Nez was trying to to do, what he wanted us to think about, was how the care that we feel to those closest to us, to our family and friends, may be extended to include all beings. So I think what what happens along the line is that we've already, in a kind of in a kind of historical sense, we do extend that care to non-human beings. But I think it's much more of an individualist pursuit than a political or social one. Rupert, you talked about the idea of the awesome early in this conversation, and Ness's writings are suffused with this sense of joy in the natural world. Is there a sort of mismatch between that and the kind of uh, apocalyptic vision that really the the green movement? In part depends on to to in order to uh, in order to stir people into action did did he share that that sort of apocalyptic vision well in a way yes i guess the way i think about this is that when people say look you can only succeed in politics by inspiring people they often say martin luther king didn't say i have a nightmare he said i have a dream but we know also that nightmares are incredibly motivating and i think part of the call of deep ecology is to be honest about the cataclysm that we're wreaking upon the world at the present time and i think the real challenge is not to be done in by that not to be not to have the joy sucked out of life by that and i think ness was brilliantly alive to the way that we need to be alive to the joy of life and in particular to the joy of being in wild places uh, if we're going to succeed. And I think that that need that we have for wild places is something profound that deep ecology offers and that is especially easy to come to in a place like Norway. We need to make sure we don't lose touch with it in a country like this one. Eki, um, Ness's book, Ness's essays are now going to be widely available um, in English thanks to this republication by Penguin. Um, It's a classic now, a classic in the the sense that Moore's Utopia Mm -hmm. is a classic, something, an artefact from the the history of, uh, of ideas or is it a handbook for the here and now. What should readers do with this book, Eki? What what should they do with it? Yeah. (laughs) Um, I'd also like to add not just Norway, but also Orkney is quite a wild place. Um, Well, I think I think it's Nez does deserve a reading. I think it's quite early days, actually, because most people haven't heard of Arne Nez as a philosopher. I think it's very important that one actually comes to grips with the meaning of deep ecology and to understand that there is a separation between a deep questioning of ourselves and any kind of political program that might be attached to it. But I think Nez's activism um, he saw that very much as part of his own philosophy. And I think what, what's really important to remember is that Nez himself said that 
with even within deep ecology, every single individual would come to their own philosophical understanding and not necessarily follow any dogma, not even his own. Thanks very much indeed. Eke de Jonga and Rupert Reed. And Arne Ness's essays, Ecology of Wisdom, is now a Penguin modern classic.